Hello and welcome to the Majlis Podcast, Radio Free Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Radio Free Radio Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. Campaigning for a parliamentary election in Kyrgyzstan will cease on November 27, a day before the actual election. The election is happening nearly a year after the country was rocked by protests and political turmoil in a controversial world and there are already accusations of misuse of funds and gerrymandering of various forms in this election. Also, this election is happening following a series of changes with regards to the states of the parliament, the election law, directly affecting the political future of the country and uh, many other issues that uh, continue to remain a source of tension. Now, what is at stake in this election? What makes this particular vote different? What does the ongoing campaigning tell us about what's next for the political direction of the Kyrgyz Republic? To discuss all these, I'm joined by Dr. Medit Toleganov, a department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek. Also joining us from Bishkek is Dr. Aijan Sharseneva, researcher at the OSC Academy, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free the Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi. Thank you, colleagues, for joining us today. So the election campaign, uh, maybe to start with you, uh, Dr. Sharsanova, how is this going so far? Any any notable development that you came across which you thought is interesting, maybe shocking? Um, I believe this election campaign has been quite interesting, but probably not as interesting as the last year's one. So far, it has been interesting to follow the, uh, the list of candidates who is actually running for the elections within the political parties. The new thing this year as well is that we have two different ways of electing parliamentaries through the political parties and as a single mandate members of parliament. I have also been following or trying to identify uh, which political parties that are running for the parliamentary elections are likely to be pro-government because usually that's where the issues and gerrymandering accusations happen. It was also interesting to see that in the last literally few days there have been series of incidents when certain pressure has been applied to certain candidates uh, and these certain candidates have been quite critical of the current leadership. So I believe this has been quite notable as well, that the, a week before the election, there is actually quite a lot of pressure happening against civic candidates. How is this uh, pressure that you are mentioning, uh, Dr. Shusanova, how, how is this seen in practice? What kind of pressure are we talking about? Well, there are different cases. So you might have heard about Dostan Bekashev, uh, mm. an independent candidate who is running in Bishkek. So he has been invited to the Kyrgyz National Security Services Committee this week to give his witness statement, if I'm not mistaken, mm. or to explain why he has been inviting minors to participate in his electoral campaign. Uh, it, the whole issue has been quite questionable because even if he has been involving minors in the electoral campaign, hmm. this is the issue that, that should have been resolved or addressed by the Central Electoral Committee, first of all. Uh, it's not a security, it's not a state security concern. Hmm. It's not a terrorist attack. It's not like uh, something that requires the attention of the security services. So that has been questionable. And then another independent candidate, Rashan Jainbekov, He's currently at the temporary detention center with the security services committee as well. He legally was able to register mm. as a candidate, but because he is detained, he doesn't have access to actually run his campaign mm. like anybody else would be able to, like his competitors are probably doing right now. So this is a big question to you. More recently, one of the candidates from Social Democrat Party has been again questioned or the security services have declared that they are looking into his case about mm. forging his uh, uh, university diploma. Mm, yeah. And again, if this did happen, first it needs to be proved, and second, it's definitely not a state security concern. Mm. And as a candidate, he has certain immunities that should have been in place. Interesting, interesting. So these are the three cases that are uh, currently uh, in the news at the moment. The, what, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, uh, also, you know, there have been series of changes uh, in the election law, in the re- referendum that the country held not long ago. How is this reflected in the way the campaigning has been taking place this year? Yes, indeed, it's uh, changed uh, quite uh, drastically, the campaign, because uh, Kyrgyzstan has shifted from uh, proportional 
representation electoral system to the mixed system. So we have now a few MPs. Instead of 120, our parliament will have 90. And uh, some of them will be elected by party lists. Hmm. And some of them will be elected through running in a single mandate districts. And basically that's what uh, signifies the difference. And also, in addition to this change, there's also changes within this uh, proportional representation part of the electoral system yeah, that yeah. The voters, when they would come, they will not only elect a candidate for their own single mandate district, and they not only will elect a party, but also from a selected party, they would need to choose uh, candidates, hmm. which they prefer, hmm. So, which means preferential voting. So a bit of a complicated system generally for voters to come and make choices. Yeah. But in overall, when we look uh, in terms of campaign and how contestation goes, it adds uh, certain dynamics, at least in terms of quite a big number of parties and uh, candidates for running for the single mandate seats. Speaking of these changes, uh, made it also new electoral law have uh, reduced the number of the seats in the parliament from 120 to who, what was that 90 90, 90 seats 90 yeah, yeah uh, you know of these seats uh, like 54 seats will be elected through national party lists and the remaining 36 will be decided in a single mandate districts also referred as a single winner voting i guess so this is um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm kind of outsider to Kyrgyz politics, and this this uh, from outside, from ten thousand feet above, this is really confusing to me. If if I were to be uh, you know voting in this election, I wouldn't know what what does this really means to me as a voter. What does this mean in practice, and is this clear for ordinary people that will be voting in this election? Yeah, indeed, it will be a bit complicated as a choice because they would need to make three choices. As I mentioned, it's, uh, they would need to choose a candidate uh, among those who are running for the single mandate seat. Then they would need to choose a party. And beside that, besides choosing a party, they would need to choose uh, which candidate within that party list they would prefer. Hmm. And uh, it's not just about the choices. The ballot itself would look a bit complicated because they need to tick a box in front of parties and find uh, among, I think it's uh, how many, 54 party list candidates, they would need to correctly pick candidates from that list. So that uh, not just the number of choices, but also complications of the ballot itself would uh, make uh, situation in the voting day on the day mm. of votes a bit complicated, I think, for many voters. Hmm. Uh, Bruce, what is standing out to you so far in this campaigning? Of course, we are going to talk about what will happen on the election day or the later. But so far, the way the campaigning has been taking place, the way these changes leading to the election has affected to the way the campaigning has been taking place. So what stands out to you? Well, the first thing I would want to mention is what, what uh, Medit was just speaking about, too, is that the voting on the party list is so complicated. You you know, you have like essentially two ballots, one, hmm. like you said, to vote for single mandate districts. But then you have another one that has a you have to know what the number is of, of the 21 parties running. You have to know what number the party you want to vote for is. And then then there's 54 boxes because every every party has 54 candidates because there's 54 seats on uh, parliamentary list. So you have to know, you know, wh- what the number of the party is you're voting wow. for and put that in. And then you have to know what the number of the candidate is that you want to vote for within that party. So obviously this is going to be a little complicated. And there was already they were already saying that, uh, you know, if you vote for a party, but for, uh, forget to put in what particular candidate it wasn't entirely clear to me. I guess the, the, at that point, the vote goes to the first person on the party list, although I'm not sure met it and I John might know. But, you know, so these are some of the things that are are a little complicated, you know, and confusing if you're trying to vote. But generally, as far as the campaigning goes, you know, one, it was great that they got rid of form number two. Uh, you know, that was a huge complication mm-hmm. in the last election. That's out. You can't register in a place where you don't live yeah. simply because you're working or because you're hanging out there. That was a major improvement in what's been going on. But we still see that there's some of the same old complaints, you know, use of administrative resources, uh, vote buying, um, not on the level it was last year when they did it. Mm. But, you know, so that it, it has been relatively cleaner in during the campaign. Not Not that there hasn't been complaints. There haven't been complaints. There has been. You know, but but compared to the to what happened in the lead up to the 2020 elections, when it, you could just see that this was a disaster coming. I mean, you know, you don't get that impression from this election. Uh, mm-hmm. While it's confusing, and and there's some new rules and and you know a new way of like I said electing the fact that you have to vote 
you, every person votes for two different candidates. Uh, you know, it is also a little confusing, but at least it doesn't seem to be such a dirty election as the one that they, they held last year. So, you know, all of you have spoken about this in this new way of w- voting. Perhaps it's kind of we are going to go into the background of this. Uh, I mean, what was the logic behind introducing this system in the first place? Uh, uh, Dr. Ejan Shurston, do you would like to take this? I mean, what was the idea, what was the calculation sure. behind introducing this system? I might be wrong, but I believe there was a combination of different ideas behind it. Mm. First of all, I think the idea was to cut down the overall number of the members of the parliament, at the parliament. Mm. And I think, secondly, it was to make them more accountable in a way, because if you have like a single mandate district, you're electing as a voter, you're electing a specific person within your district, so in a way you have access, well, ideally, you will have an access to that person when they become uh, a member of parliament and you can talk to them, address them your issues or request them to address the issues within that district. So in a way, I can see some logic behind it. My only concern is this complication and confusion. And you're right that we political scientists, supposedly well-educated people, supposedly professionals in this area, we still had to look closely and read carefully the rules to figure out how to vote and how to place our, how to ballot our vote. And this is something that probably would not be the case for the majority of people simply because elections should be easy and simple and accessible to all citizens who are able to vote. And Mm. I believe that is deliberate, to be honest, because I believe that when you complicate a simple process, an ideally simple process like elections, it's easier to manipulate it, it's easier to make it more complicated for people to actually express their actual will and mm. participate in the political life of the mm. uh, of the country. Same happened in the uh, January referendum about the constitution. The mm. question, which form is better, parliamentary or presidential, is a very complex one. You could write a whole dissertation about yeah. that. And you ask people to answer that question in just one go, one tick, figure it out on the day. So I believe that's quite deliberate and quite unfortunate. The, aside from this confusion, uh, of course, part, you know, elections always happens on issues. I mean, is, is there anything stands out, made it to you in terms of what are the issues on the table that the parliamentarian hopefuls are talking about or the parties are talking about? What, what are the issues on the agenda this time? Well, it's a bit difficult uh, to specifically find out important issues because uh, <clears throat> programs of many parties uh, look similar. We talk often about the same issues. And uh, as it happens quite often, with, uh, it, it was ex- expected with a sing- single mandate district running, running. It's, they mostly talk about the local issues. And that was, of course, expected. But they're trying to appeal this uh, few thousand voters who live in certain localities and just to address the issues. Parties are still trying to focus on the nationwide issues, but I think it's uh, not yet, I haven't seen at least anything specific which uh, stands out as uh, certain contestational issues. Of course, uh, certain debates yet to come, and we perhaps will see if something will come out, come out of that. But uh, as maybe experience of previous elections been showing that uh, that was quite often what was lacking, the content of elections, not about the choice of personality, but rather certain ideas. Some people, voters will choose ideas or will choose people or personalities, even within parties. So we don't see any ideas which are being discussed, and it's uh, neither from parties which are close to the government, mm. nor, say, mm. From this opposition party, so they, of course, they're trying to focus and maybe on that spectrum pro government or pro opposition parties. They trying to maybe tackle certain issues related to freedoms, maybe to some extent, government accountability and so forth. But uh, the difference maybe is not as big. So as a, as a voter, I'm, I, w- I would be wondering, like, um, you know, how to differentiate in those parties when I'm casting my ballot. There was also uh, changes in terms of the uh, not only the seats in the parliament, but also transferring some of the legislative powers to the president that took place in recent days. Earlier, and I, I and Bruce, we were talking about what does this really mean for the states of the parliament uh, as a decision-making body after these changes? The parliament is uh, even a relevant decision-making body anymore, you know. Okay, maybe let's continue that discussion on that topic uh, shortly. But 
First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis podcast, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Medet uh, Toliganov, a department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek. Also joining us from Bishkek is Dr. Aijan Sharsanova, researcher at the OSC Academy, uh, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready for Free the Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Ready for Free the Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. And we are discussing the upcoming elections in Kyrgyzstan and their implications for the country's political future. So there is a lot to discuss in terms of the future of the parliament, given the recent changes, given also considerably parliament losing power under, under the new constitution. Still, the way I hear uh, Medit and Ajan, you guys talk about these election-looking environment in Kyrgyzstan, still, despite all these changes, people are interested, the way it sounds to me, people are interested in this election and what they are voting for. So, uh, Medit, let's, let's go with you. Yeah, usually it's, of course, quite often noticeable uh, through various advertisements, billboards, whatever advertisements of campaigns happening in the social media or in media generally. Mm. That's how it's uh, quite often is visible. Mm. And, uh, of course, we see a lot of candidates are trying to organize various uh, whatever meetings with the prospective voters with their own constituencies throughout different localities. That's, uh, I think, it's, uh, it's noticeable, yes. And, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's, for many voters, I think it's, of course, difficult to escape from that uh, because it's quite often noticeable. And as we talked uh, in the beginning, it's in terms of complication of choice when you see the billboards, of course, it's right. quite often this numbers, number of party, number of the candidate, and of course that confusion besides faces or certain slogans and texts, you know, candidates are trying to press the voters with the numbers, right. uh, trying to put an imprint on the numbers what they should come up with when they will come to the voting booth. So the campaigning is go- long going, and then uh, I think once we'll have more intense uh, debates, then I think that we'll also more vividly, at least to some extent, will come through various televisions. And of course, uh, yeah. through national television, first of all. Yeah. Maybe that's one of the biggest channels, how parties and certain candidates can reach out to the voters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In, in terms of parliament, though, after these uh, reduction of seats, and, and also, yeah, let me ask this question first. I mean, uh, the logic, the calculation behind reducing seats in the parliament, what was that? Uh, I think generally there was a, a lot of public sentiments against the parliament and the idea of parliamentarism, which was associated with uh, this uh, parliament, in, uh, for example, current MPs. Hmm. And uh, current president uh, Jafara, when he came to power last year, of course, he utilized that uh, sentiment, saying, well, well, power should be transferred to the president, so president has now legislative powers, and uh, parliament lost a lot of uh, powers in regard to appointing and dismissing cabinet members. So that shifted also to the president. So in that sense, uh, the newly elected parliament will be much weaker in terms of its institutional basis, and it has less powers than the current parliament. Hmm. And despite that, of course, there is uh, a lot of uh, competition. And uh, the outlook of new parliament, of course, after elections in regard to its place within this whole governance system Hmm. will be a bit problematic given the predominance of president, mm. generally formally, mm. but also informally because Jabarov enjoys still relatively high popularity. But hopefully if some more or less decent and uh, candidates who has more or less uh, neutral and dissenting voice will end up in the parliament, then the parliament can still fulfill the function of being a forum for a certain critical voice to come within the government and to raise certain critical issues. So I think that's uh, perhaps the only viable function which the parliament that's may have after elections. That's very interesting. Dr. Shasan, anything to add on that? I mean, the place of the parliament after all these changes that we have seen in the referendum taking place about the states of the parliament, about the future of the parliament, the seats and all the legislative rules that the the parliament usually has. um, So it it has reduced significantly. So Medit was talking about, you know, where does this put parliament going forward in Kyrgyzstan? So where do you see parliament? What kind of role it's playing going forward in in the whole system? It is a very good but very complicated question because I agree with my dad that as a form for political discussions, I think if you have a couple of really opinionated and well-spoken members of parliament who do, do not necessarily agree with the pro-government position, that should be enough to spark debates within the parliament and to, in a way, to direct the protest potential of the public to the parliament as well, to see that these issues are discussed at least as some sort of form. 
but given that a lot of the powers have been taken away from the parliament and were given to the president, I see it more as a problem. And not because I don't believe in a presidential system, but because the current system as it is, is not very well balanced in a way. Sanya Taktagaziva, actually uh, one of the prominent lawyers of Kyrgyzstan, did a really good analysis and she noted that the biggest, the huge issue with the current constitution is that the parts of it are not balanced. It's a, in a way, it's a Frankenstein of a political system that where parts do not necessarily fit well together. And state is such a subtle, such a complex and such a sensitive mechanism that requires to be sold through <clears throat> to the smallest detail to make sure that it runs smoothly. And I don't believe that the president and the current leadership of the country had enough time or enough capacity to ensure that it has been thought through in that required detail to make sure that the state can run smoothly. So in a way, this political system where the parliament has reduced powers and the president has way more powers than before might not necessarily be a well-functioning presidential system. So we'll see how it goes, to be honest. Bruce, I think we ended up where we earlier talking about the, the future of the parliament and their current circumstances. As our guests are saying, like, you know, at least uh, the parliament will stay as a platform where people can raise their uh, their voices in case of some opposition voices ends up in the parliament. You know, in countries, you would like to see parliament play more broader, more bigger, more visible role beyond being just a platform for a discussion. In in this circumstances, again, the question comes to what, what you are talking about earlier, how much parliament is going to be relevant in the political landscape of Kyrgyzstan going forward under current circumstances? Well, I suppose that a lot's going to depend on the outcome of the the vote. You know, there's 21 parties, like we know, and uh, and about half of them are, are new or, or they're rebranded or reformed or something like that. So the names aren't so familiar, you know, but but a party like Atta McCann, right, been around for a long time. Um, yeah. You know, people people at least know that. Now, we know that, you know, Omar Bek Takibayev has been a critic of several presidents in the past. And it, it, so if, if they do well and parties like Atta McCann, but, but Atta McCann specifically, if they do well, for example, then then you would imagine there would be a, a critical voice in, in the parliament um, that would question a lot of moves that, that President Japarov um, might might undertake or something like that. So that would be that would be beneficial. Okay. I would I would say. Okay, but they, 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 they might. Someone... Uh, sorry for interrupting you. Let's say imagine that people like Tekvai ends up in the parliament or a couple others uh, in a similar profile, and they might have a platform to raise their voices and in critical terms talk about uh, mistakes that governments make. Is that going to matter? You know, like I said, the one, first they won't have any power to to override overrule the president. But at least they can bring some of these issues up, and, and in fact, depending on how the makeup of parliament is, uh, they they you know they could face strong resistance from pro presidential parties that also have m- many candidates that are elected to parliament too. But but at least these issues would get raised, uh, as opposed to a purely rubber stamping body. You know that that if it was overwhelmingly pro presidential parties, and like Atajod Kyrgyzstan comes to is another example of like what a pro presidential party would look like. If parties like this end up filling up most of the parliamentary seats, then you really get. No debate. You just get the rubber stamping parliament. So there would there would still be value in parliament if there was an, enough deputies with opposing views from opposition parties, however you want to phrase it, that would be willing to question a lot of things that the government does. So at least the issues would get raised, uh, and the public could it would be the public could consider it on their own. You know, what do they think about that? At least they would have somebody saying maybe the course that the president's taking is not the right course, and maybe this is something. Uh, you know, that instead we should be thinking about that's good. Like I said, they won't be in any position to to challenge decisions that Jafarov makes. They couldn't change it, actually, but they could at least give voice to it and bring it up in, for the public to consider themselves uh, what's going on. Now, you know, further down the line, of course, we also got to consider that the history of Kyrgyzstan's politics shows that it's very fluid. Uh, you know, a lot of people were resentful that Parliament didn't do enough, and they, they thought there was too much infighting and bickering for them to actually accomplish anything. That's what really, you know, in the last elections, and that's what led to the changes. Uh, that was part of, you know, Japarov's reasoning for, for having, you know, taken strip powers from Parliament and, and reducing the size with it. Nothing was getting done because there was too much debate, not enough action, right? Like I said, the way Kyrgyzstan's history has worked, we have no idea that, that Parliament will stay in the role that it's currently assigned right now.
So there's always the chance that that we'll move to some other some different system. It's not like Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan mm-hmm. or something where or Tur- uh, where Parliament is always going to go along with what the president says. They might have to go along with the, what the president says for now, but that situation could change. The mm-hmm. equation could change not even that much further down the line. Um, yeah. So so the parliamentary elections still have importance because we don't know what will happen with the office of the presidency and, and how people will respond to future changes. It, it, we could easily see another upheaval of some kind, hopefully not a revolution or anything like that, but a, something that happens that tells people we have mm. to give more powers back to the parliament. You know, and the parliament that's in power right now was elected in 2015. Yeah, yeah that's true, Bruce. Thank you very much for that. But, you know, the way we are talking about the future of the Kyrgyz parliament, it sounds to me we lowered the bar so much. If you limit the, the rule of the parliament to be a platform where people just uh, are there to raise their voices, which probably will have no legislative effect. But from Kyrgyzstan, I guess you expect more compared to parliaments in the neighboring countries. Maybe this is where we are in new Kyrgyzstan. But also that that leads me to another question. How does this kind of parliament factors in what President Jabarov has in mind about the, the country's uh, political future? Perhaps uh, Dr. Shersenova or maybe Medet, just feel free. I believe that given the the reform, the, the constitutional reform that happened this year, uh, President Japarov has actually collected a huge amount of powers in his hands to the point where the president is, in fact, the micromanager of the country, where he appoints quite a lot of positions that has been appointed before by other powers, whether executive or the legislative. So it actually, well, it certainly fits into this picture where the president is a micromanager with unlimited powers and the parliament is there just to create this forum for discussion. So in a way, it has worked out well for him, uh, I believe, as he suggested that the constitutional reform. But to what extent that's sustainable, that's not a question. Like, to what extent can we carry on managing or keeping the political battles balanced within the parliament when the parliament doesn't have much power, that is a big question. And how long that can continue for without creating another protest potential of a larger scale, that is also a question. And a lot depends on this winter as well, because as Mm. you know, winters in Kyrgyzstan are particularly hard, given the energy shortages, given the price of coal going up, Mm. the increase in prices for the basic foods, everything is very much complicated. Like, if you look back a year ago, things for ordinary people have gotten worse in terms mm. of access to healthcare, access to education, access to basic needs, like right. physical needs, like warmth and food. So in this regard, a lot depends on the capacity of the current leadership to address these issues immediately, but also in the eyes of the public, because we can see that the, the leadership and the security services and some other ministries are at the moment busy with electoral campaigns, with political discussions and debates. And in the eyes of the public, this does not look very good because when the public is struggling with basic needs and the people who are in charge of providing those basic needs are diverting their attention to something else, that definitely does not create a good image of this leadership. So Mm. I think a lot will depend on how the leadership manages to win that. Yeah, but I think uh, that you also have something to add in that. But one one thought that comes to my mind is after having so much power in one person's hand, I guess whatever challenge comes on on his way uh, or in Kyrgyzstan, I mean, I guess the President Jabarov has no one else to blame except himself. Um, Medet, any any final thoughts there? Yeah, just to add to what I just said that mm-hmm. it's indeed uh, it's just uh, after 2010 there were jokes that the people protesting in Bishkek and they say quite often don't know where to go because parliament was sitting in one building, government in another building, but the powers were diffused and then the blame attribution was also diffused. But now Japan, of course, concentrated a lot of powers and he himself deliberately made responsible, as he said, accountable for everything, which means that the grievances then will be channeled by likely, for example, unhappy opposition leaders, then it's quite easy to pinpoint yeah. who to blame, to blame for. No, that's that's a very interesting point. Okay, so uh, maybe Bruce then, final thoughts from you. So, uh, yeah, so in how many days? Like in less than two weeks, Kyrgyzstan will have the election, so they will have a new parliament. Yeah, so until the election day and after the election day. So what? where are the areas that you you will be watching? Well, the, uh, the debates and, and what happens with some of the more prominent People who are, we mentioned Dastan Bakeshav as being one, uh, but there's other figures out there too. Uh, how, how do they make it through the last? So the home stretch of the campaign, uh, are they going to be, you know, pressured, harassed, something like that? You know, is the, is the government going to worry or are they just going to let them 
campaign as they wish and go through, you know, figuring that maybe once the results are in, there'll be a, such a small minority that they can't really, you know, do anything, even if they're in parliament. But just to make sure that, that it's like as clean as possible. Like I said, I, I know that's kind of hard. There's going to be some people that you're almost sure are going to be elected. Iskander Matarima is one, right? You know, yeah. the, the brother of uh, Ryan Beck, mm. who's made headlines all over the place. So, you know, he's going to get in. Tashiev has a brother that's running, you know, the guy they put in charge of the Kumtor gold mining operation has a, I think his son is in there, and he also has a brother or something, too, I think, that's running in this election, too. Are these people going to be given special advantage? Are people going to be complaining that there was administrative resources thrown in to help them out, thrown out there to help them into the seats, you know? And like I said, from the, on the opposite view, are there is there obstacles being created for opposition candidates, you know, just there's not so much backlash from people, you know, people looking at these elections as being so rigged uh, that they were practically worthless or something. Oh, and the other thing, I suppose, on Election Day, which is November 28th, by the way, mm. um, is how many people actually turn out to vote. You know, it's mm. always been a question. Mm. You know, even President Jafarov won with an overwhelming, you know, 80 percent or something to the vote. But in fact, if you do the math, then the number of people that actually voted for him is less than 20 percent of the country. You know, so so what? Who? How many people are going to turn out to vote? This has been a big question for for weeks and actually months now. Is you know, it's the fourth election in Kyrgyzstan this year. Are people burned out about this whole thing? If they show up, then uh, how many are going to show up and what will that represent as far as a popular will of the nation? Yeah, um, I was thinking to end the conversation here, but the prediction part of the uh, discussion is uh, one of my favorites. So if you if you guys can briefly share your predictions until the election or the election day, uh, the day after the election, what would that would be? Uh, Dr. Shersenova, let's start with you then, then Medet, and with that we will end the conversation. Even before the elections, I think I'll be looking forward to the debate, the official debate hmm. between the political parties that will take place from the 22nd of November onwards. I will be interested for the reason you mentioned before. I don't see much political ideology. I don't see many political platforms Mm. over there. And I would like to see if they have anything that they might be able to say during the debate. I would also be interested in the turnout as well, because Mm. as you might know, the last two elections in the country, they had notoriously low turnout. So it would be interesting to see if people actually (coughs) turn up to the station polls and uh, vote. And third, again, the fact that the pressure is already happening on specific candidates, that's quite dangerous. And I wonder how far the uh, the pressure would go. I definitely don't want to witness anything that yeah. we don't want to witness, but yeah. it would be interesting to see how bad they would be. And finally, I hope that people realize that this is actually the last chance to balance the uh, very presidential, very single, very authoritarian style uh, political system, because if there are more people within the parliament who would provide different voices or represent different er- different uh, groups of population, there are more chances that the protest potential will actually bloom within the parliament and stay within the legitimate field rather mm. than overflow and create another mess. Terrific. Thank you very much. Um, so, Medit, uh, last point from you. Yes, uh, Bruce and Ajahn, of course, I've been watching also, I've been watching for the days to see how this content of discussion very so easily come up. In debates, and then of course it will be interesting to see how what will be the chances for this would be opposition critical voices with parties, for example, like Apanikian and mm-hmm. Alliance, which go together there is political and opposition forces, whether they will have chances. And then I think it will be also interesting to see how this uh, single mandate districts voting will happen, how yeah. these votes in various uh, districts will spread across various candidates, and whether it will also give chances for interesting candidates. First, from a political standpoint, uh, was there some, again, critical voices, interesting candidates, for example, the cash of in a single mainly district. But also to see how voters will be aligning themselves in terms of their own identity, whether ethnicity, gender, and various other aspects can come up in this specific part of this election. So maybe that will be something as an interesting feature to observe how people are getting attached to candidates from that perspective. That will be my expectations. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we have to conclude the conversation here, but uh, we will be watching. Our eyes will be open as to what comes next until the election, in the election day and the post-election era. So with this, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Medet Tuliganov, a p- department chair and professor at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek. 
Also, big thanks to Dr. Aijan Shersenova, researcher at the OSC Academy, also was joining us from Bishkek, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free Pride Liberties, Central Asia blog, Kishlok Owazi, who was joining us from Prague. Thank you very much, colleagues, for uh, your time and sharing your thoughts with us today. And this is from me, Mohamed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Radio Free Pride Liberties media manager in Washington, D.C. Until next week, bye-bye.